aby nám zůstal nějaký čas na závěrečnou diskuzi, tak rovnou předávám slovo paní Marcelin Nody, aby nás informovala o tom, co to vlastně je to Grévio, co dělá a co to bude znamenat pro Českou republiku v případě, že ratifikuje Istanbulskou mluvu. Marcelin do Floris yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here, although it's also very tiring because Malta is very far away, which is where I came from, and I will be going back. So my energy is a bit low, but I have a lot of energy. Okay. Um, uh, I would like to say that, start by saying that although I love children, I do not want to steal yours. I, have be, I heard it said at least twice that Marceline Audi is going to steal your children. I am not going to steal your children, okay? Just to make that, just to make that clear. Um, a lot of what I have in the first slides has already been said, so I will go through them a bit fast and then concentrate on the, on the second half. However, I feel that I really need to emphasize we are talking about violence against women. We are talking about millions of women who experience throughout their lives different forms of violence, of abuse, etc. This is what we are talking about. I was a member of the CAVIO that drafted this convention. And I remember feeling this great weight of responsibility because we were talking about women's lives, we were talking about people's lives, we were talking about human rights. And as you know, Malta is very, 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 very small, okay? And I was aware that we were talking not only about the 250,000 women in Malta, but we were talking about the millions of women all over Europe, including in the Czech Republic. So I feel I just need to emphasize this very strongly. This is what we are talking about. We are talking about lives, people's lives. We're talking about their basic human rights to live a life free from violence. We know that many women are, are afraid or ashamed to come, th to come forward and report. <coughs> And sometimes they pay for their silence with their lives. And this is an unacceptable situation. And that is what we are talking about. The Istanbul Convention at the end of the day is the Council of Europe Convention on preventing and combating violence against women and domestic violence. And that is why we have this convention because these are things which are unacceptable. The Istanbul Convention is already widely recognized as the most far-reaching legal instrument to prevent, to combat violence against women and domestic violence as a violation of human rights. You have already heard this, but I will say it again and I will say it again, because this is what it is about. This is what we are talking about. Clearly, the aims are stated in the first article as the prevention of, protection from, and prosecution of violence against women. What the Convention requests from governments who have ratified is that they take a comprehensive set of measures, so they look at it all together, to tackle all forms of violence against women and domestic violence, that every measure in the Convention is meant to prevent violence, to help victims, to ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. And surely, putting an end to violence against women and domestic violence must be an important policy concern for any government that is committed to ensuring the human rights of all. So for the first time ever, in our history, and those of you who are looking, me, looking at me know that my history is longer than most of yours in this room at the moment, um, uh, but the first time ever 
in our history. The Convention makes it clear that violence against women and domestic violence can no longer be considered as a private matter, but that states have an obligation to prevent the violence, to protect the, the victims, and to punish the perpetrators, and that this will help victims all over Europe and beyond. As has already been said in relation to the Czech Republic, but again I will say it again, it also gives an important political signal to society as a whole that this, these things are completely unacceptable. So it, place, it does place an obligation. The obligation that it places is to prevent and combat violence against women within the wider framework of achieving equality between women and men. And as that has already been mentioned before as well. Because of this, there is reference to the relations between women and men and the roles and attributes assigned to them. And that is why the Convention includes a definition on gender in Article 3C. And that definition explains that they are Gender is considered as socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for women and men. So again, we're talking about violence against women, domestic violence within the framework of equality. We know that certain roles or stereotypes can reproduce unwanted and harmful practices and can contribute to making violence against women more acceptable. And we heard um, uh, a colleague just in the previous panel talking about education um, uh, throughout the schooling and how important it is to teach respect, um, uh, that, uh, people's integrity, etc. And that some prejudices, customs, traditions, practices which are based on the idea of inferiority of women that, or on stereotype gender roles, that these need to be overcome. So the Istanbul Convention is clear that the term gender, as defined in the Convention, is not intended as a replacement for the terms women and men. The preamble of the Convention recognizes the structural nature of violence, the structural nature, so within the structural framework. This um, uh, structural uh, nature is both a cause and a consequence of unequal power relations between women and men, and this limits the full advancement of women. So it is based on the principle of equality between women and men, but the Istanbul Convention is not there to abolish differences between women and men or to suggest that women and men are or should be the same. However, it clearly does require action to counter the idea that women are inferior to men. Our aim is not to steal children or to regulate family life or family structures. The Convention requires that governments ensure the safety of victims who find themselves in dangerous situations at home or who are threatened by family members, whether they are spouses, intimate partners, etc. And we know, unfortunately, that this is the most common form of violence. The Convention does seek to change mentalities in a way to move away from gender stereotypes and sexist attitudes. So ideas that women are inferior to men. So the convention does seek to move away from the ideas that women are inferior to men. And as was also mentioned by one of the people before me, the Istanbul Convention was not something that somebody woke up one day and thought, oh, what shall we do? I know, let's write a convention. Let's just do that. Let's do that this afternoon. Whoops, there you go, there it is. Okay? That's not the way it happened at all. It was a result of long discussions 
eventually, and I mean eventually, because I was there, believe me, it was a long discussion, eventually leading to a unanimous adoption by all Council of Europe member states. It, was based, it is based on policies, legislations, which have been tried and tested, and which have produced positive results at the level of the member states. So just to be clear, the cornerstones of the Istanbul Convention are that it addresses all forms of violence against women and domestic violence in preventing violence, protecting its victims, prosecuting the perpetrators, together with the requirement to coordinate any such measures through comprehensive policies, so working together again as one of my uh, as one of the previous speakers um, spoke to me. And at heart, it is a renewed call for greater equality between women and men. So the underlying message of the Convention is that every single form of gender-based violence must be responded to in a swift, professional manner, putting the rights and needs of victims, their safety, their empowerment at the centre. That is what we are talking about. As I said, this did not happen overnight. So first there was a task force set up, to, a task force to combat violence against women, including domestic violence. They worked for many months, and they then recommended a European Human Rights Convention to prevent and combat violence against women. As a result of that, the CAVIA was set up, and the CAVIA was the community. Com <laughs> Comité ad hoc violence contre la femme. So the, the group of national experts that drafted the convention. So then there was the convention and the explanatory report. And I mentioned the explanatory report because we're all quoting from the convention, but there's also the explanatory report, which explains, because that's what it's there for, it explains things which maybe are not clear. And then there was the Grevio monitoring group, which I now sit on. And then the monitoring started. So I am going to now focus um, uh, on the Gerebio after this last couple of slides. So the state of play at the moment is this. They are ratified. 33 countries have ratified. And you see them up there on the screen. There are 13 who have signed but not ratified, including, of course, the Czech Republic. And, as has already been said, two who have neither signed nor ratified, Azerbaijan and Russian Federation. And, of course, there's the European Union who has signed but not as yet ratified. So, the Grevio is the independent expert body responsible for monitoring the implementation of the convention. So now we have the convention, various people have ratified it, some people have signed but not yet ratified it, but hopefully they will soon ratify it as well. And the job of the Gravio is to make sure that they have not just ratified and deposited their instruments of ratification at the Council of Europe, but that they are actually implementing it. Article 66 of the Istanbul Convention governs the Grevio membership. So again, even the Grevio was, uh, is, is governed by the Convention. After the 10th ratification of the Convention, there were 10 members elected. And recently, uh, after the 25th ratification, there were a further five members elected. Although I am on the Grevio, I am not there as a representative of Malta, and this is always made very clear. Once you have been elected onto the Grevio, you are independent. You are independent of your country. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to do with the monitoring of your country, of course, because of possible conflict of interest, but you are there as an independent expert. Grevio held its first meeting in September 2015. It's adopted its rules of procedure. It's elected its president and vice president. I was elected as second vice president at that point, but the president and vice president have a two-year term. So after two years, there was another election, and I then became the first um, uh, vice president of the gra uh, Gravio. We then, by March 2016, and there was a lot of pressure put on us to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. 
do it, do it, do it. We finally uh, issued the questionnaire in March 2016, um, uh, and then we launched the first evaluation procedure. I'm just going to go through that. That's okay. So, these are the members of Grevio. Ferida Akar, or Achar. Me, Simona Lanzonia, who is from Italy, and she's a second vice president. Biliana Brankovic from Serbia. Francoise Brie from Fr uh, France. Gemma Gallego from Spain. Helena Leitao from Portugal, Rosa Logar from Austria, Iris Luarsi from Albania, Vesna Ratkovic from Montenegro, and from May 2018, the five new members. So the five new members have so far attended one, one meeting, who are from Sweden, Germany, Georgia, Norway, and the Netherlands. And this is a pretty picture of all of us with the new members which was taken uh, earlier this month um, in Strasbourg when we met for the first time. Okay, so what is it that we're doing actually apart from going to Strasbourg and coming to talks like this of course because this is also part of what we do. We've already had 15 meetings in all um, as, as I said, first meeting was dedicated to setting up rules of procedure, etc. Then we started working on the first baseline questionnaire, which was agreed on and adopted at our fifth meeting in March 2016. We started the evaluation straight after, and we've been working on them ever since. Evaluations are carried out on a country-by-country -country basis. The procedure is triggered by Grevio when we send out the questionnaire to the state parties concerned. We try to gather as much information as possible and we try to ensure that the process as much as possible is dialogue oriented. So it goes both ways. Hmm? We ask, we listen, we speak, they listen. A dialogue, a proper dialogue. It actually takes approximately a year and a half to complete the full procedure for each country from when we send out the questionnaire till when we publish the actual Grevio report. So far, the Grevio evaluation procedures seem to show that efforts are being intensified, for example, in the collection of data, because that is an issue almost everywhere, the collection of data on the different forms of violence against women. However, definitions and methods are not always harmonized across entities, so there is an issue there. And important data categories such as sex, relationship of perpetrator to the victim, etc., are at times also still lacking. For example, one of the things we would like to be able to see, but we are very rarely able to see, is how a domestic violence case can be traced hmm, from reporting, from when a woman or a person reports a domestic violence case through invest to the investigation, through to the prosecution, courts, and um, uh, sentencing. So it is very rarely possible to follow that process through, throughout in relation to the data collection. However, there are, again, new methods being considered, such as unique person numbers. Things are being tried and tested to see how this can be resolved. We also see that the effects of the Istanbul Convention on national policy and legislation is already being seen. So we're already seeing um, positive results in this respect as well. For example, there has been a trend towards criminalizing more forms of violence against women, such as stalking, uh, female genital mutilation, forced marriage, etc. More countries are setting up coordinating bodies who will be responsible for the monitoring in their country and, and being the contact person. And there seem to be more large-scale training initiatives being carried out in various countries. So now I'm going to go through the steps in the first baseline evaluation procedures so that you know what happens step by step. 
So actually the first step, as I said, is when the Grevio sends out to the country concerned that is going to be monitored, sends out the questionnaire, which is online. I mean, anybody can see it any time. It's there. But we send it out to them and tell them, please uh, write up a report based on this questionnaire and give it to us by this date. We also gather other information. So we gather information from, first of all, if there have been recent reports, CEDAW reports, for example, or uh, Greco reports or some other UN human rights report, anything like that, recent ones on the country concerned, we gather them together. We also uh, receive information from NGOs, from civil society. So if, a civil, if the civil society wishes to give us information, we accept it and we accept it uh, willingly. We gather all of this um, uh, information and then we examine the report that has been sent by the state together with any other um, supporting information. From this we normally pull out a few issues. Hmm? So we say, mm, look, this is really good here. Mm, look, over here maybe they, uh, they are not mentioning this. Uh, do they have it? Do they not have it? We don't know. It's not mentioned. Uh, so we gather issues that we think we need to tackle uh, when we visit. Hmm? I forgot to mention, possibly because it's coming up, because I always do this, um, uh, that there are two rapporteurs appointed to each country. Okay, so if, so for example, if I can use Austria, I was um, one of the rapporteurs for Austria. Mm -hmm. So me and the other rapporteur looked at all the information, considered uh, issues or, or things that we needed more information on, together with the secretariat always, huh? and um, uh, we then um, uh, asked the questions that we, we felt we needed to ask in order to gather more information. Five minutes, five minutes. Um, uh, okay, so there has been one step, just for your information, that has been removed. Okay, so when we did Austria, which was, um, as you heard, one of the first countries, um, we had a state delegation come to Strasbourg and we, quest we, we, we raised various questions with them. That has been eliminated now. So what we actually do now is we visit the country and the first meeting that we have in the country was normally with um, representatives from various ministries where we start by um, uh, having that, what we used to call the state dialogue, actually in place in the country as a first, uh, at the first meeting that we have. Whilst we are on the visit, we also visit, uh, we also talk to many other people, professionals, pr practitioners. Sometimes we visit specific um, uh, places like maybe police stations or social services um, or uh, specific NGOs, residences, um, etc. It's always very, very intense, very, very uh, like you're doing something all of the time. Um, uh, and we normally, as I said, speak to as many people as possible to get as, um, as wide an idea as possible. Following that, we, we consider all the information, the information that we had before, the information that we have gathered as a result of the visit, and then we prepare the draft Gravio report. This draft Gravio report, I will actually move on to the next slide, this draft Gravio report is sent to the state party. Okay, so we prepared our report, we sent it, I'm going to use Austria again since uh, Maria Pratner is near me, um, and we sent it to the Austrian state. They looked at it, as other countries do, you, know, you look at it and you say, hmm, look, they didn't understand this well because this is obviously not uh, what we said or what we do or whatever. So if you have any further comments, you, you send them back and you say, look, this was not well understood. Um, uh, we have more information on this. We can give it to you, whatever. Okay? Those comments are then considered by the graveyard. Some of them are taken on board where it is considered that they are reasonable um, uh, requests. I mean, 
it's very easy for us to not understand something, make a mistake, whatever. Um, uh, and we then finalize the report, and that report is sent to the Committee of the Parties. The Committee of the Parties are the representatives of the various countries who have ratified the Convention. The Committee of the Parties then considers our report, and it then comes out with recommendations um, uh, for the country concerned. We also always ask that the state also makes the report and the findings of Gravio available to the national parliament. We've completed several evaluations. We've completed Albania, Austria, Denmark and Monaco, which means that their final reports have been published and they're on the website. Very soon we will have Montenegro and Turkey also uh, final reports on the website. By early next year, we hope to have Portugal and Sweden. By midsummer next year, Finland, France, etc., etc. All reports are public. This needs to be uh, clear as well. So all reports are public, and they will be um, uh, on the website. And there you can see um, uh, the the process. This timetable is also on the website, and um, uh, you can you can find it. So. This is the first legally binding instrument to provide for comprehensive measures addressing prevention of violence, protection of victims, prosecution of perpetrators, and integrated policies. I remind you, this is exactly what we are talking about. Overall, I think that the evaluations are going relatively well. We have a good team, varied backgrounds. Some come from a legal background, some come from service provision, some come from policy making uh, positions, etc. We have a secretariat, the Grevia secretariat, who work very, very hard. They need more people, uh, but money is always an issue and a problem, even in Grevia. Um, uh, they are there's lots of work, lots of time wasted traveling. There's too few of us, but now we have five more, so that's good, and hopefully things will move forward faster. But generally, overall, I think it's, um, uh, it's going quite well. Now, I got that from Google Translate, so if it's wrong, <laughs> blame Google Translate. <laughs> Thank you.